welcome to the seventh episode of Demol Valkyrie Season 10 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Hamstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who's never held animal nipples in his hand before, Logan Saunders. Good evening. I was spoilt for choice with what I could have made your intro this week, given the uh, the recurring joke of you having an extensive porn collection, but oh my god, I was a little bit uncomfortable with Jens's behaviour around a goat, being perfectly <laughs> honest. There were a lot of suggestive remarks. It was uncomfortable. <laughs> it felt like we were slightly intruding. Yeah, he needed some alone time. What a deeply odd episode. I loved it, because I've been avoiding spoilers for the past 24 hours before we recorded this. And I was genuinely surprised and disappointed that Manny went, but I knew that something was going to get announced at the end of the episode, given that we got linked to the uh, to the video that Playfair had put up of the ending with Jill winking at us. Yeah. I knew something was coming, I just didn't know what it was. I guess we can jump ahead of that. I guess it sounds like the final quiz will be will be happening live? I'm not sure if the final test will. I think it's likely that an error will come up as they finish their 30 questions about the identity and actions of the mole, whoever knows the most wins however much money. I think it's likely an error will come up on the screen and then Jill will come up and once all three of them have got the error, go, oh, by the way, the game is just not finished yet. You still got one more challenge, one more chance to earn money, and it's going to be live on stage at Palais 12. I'm more interested as to what's going to happen about us and everyone in the press room. Because as I said to you when you were watching the episode earlier, are we going to be watching the episode up until the final test and then then not finding out who the mole is? Are we going to be talking to the final three and not knowing who the mole is? We could just grill them like 1940s detectives. We could play a good cop, bad cop when we're interviewing all three of them. I think we actually might have to. I think we need to try and get the exclusive of who the mole is and see who lies with their eyes. That might be how we have to play this. <laughs> Listen here, jerk one, I don't like you and you don't like me. I obviously had these these notes or the, the template of these notes written last week going, oh yeah, I need to mention Diary of the Mole Finale 2, don't forget about that. I don't know what form Diary of the Mole Finale 2 is going to take, because... We could genuinely release it before the subs come out, because we're not going to know who the mole is when we're recording that episode, I think, now. It's going to be super interesting. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to play it for the press people. Also, on another note, it's very odd to refer to us as press. I know, I was thinking this. I'm like, I am not a journalist. I am not press. I'm just kind of a, a stupid podcaster who's done this for nine years now. <laughs> we're flies on the wall. Someone who has stumbled ass backwards into somehow going to the second press event of a Belgian show. We could easily be swatted out of the press room if we don't play properly once inside. Yeah, I actually think that this has has a bit more pressure to it because we know what to expect this time, and we know that we are kind of going to have to be on our best behaviour. We can't really get away with asking the ball whether they hate women this time, for example. Yeah, I, I still remember my reaction to when you said that without any context to Elizabeth. <laughs> To be fair, she knew the context, she'd just forgotten about it. But yeah, we do have to kind of be on our best behaviour next week, I think. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that's a week away. Less than a week away. Yeah, it, we're recording this on Monday, as I said. It's In six days' time, we're going to be sat in Palais 12, finding out who the mole is, potentially with 10,000 other people. Yeah, so I'm supposed to get from, I think tomorrow night, yeah, tomorrow night I fly from Armenia to there. It's going to be fun. But yeah, I've been thinking about this the past uh, the past couple of days. Like, how are we actually considered press? I don't consider us press. We're good promoters. <laughs> oh yeah, we're great promoters. We're absolutely the sort of people you want on your side when it comes to a TV production. But I don't understand how we are press. Not to say that if Jill or Lisa or anyone from from Playfair are listening, that they can rescind our invitations. Please don't. <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't consider us press. I just consider us two very lucky bastards, being perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we won the lottery. We really did. I remember my, my reaction when uh, when you forwarded over the email from Lise last time going, oh, by the way, you're going as press. Because that came up on my, uh, my Facebook memories a couple of days ago. And I'm like, oh my God, I remember how excited I was sat in a car park. Like, I just pulled up to, um, to be on the local radio and I was sitting in the... Um, 
in the car park and you'd messaged me as I was driving it come it came through my car because you know I've got a nice car must be nice and when I stopped at the car park and checked my emails I'm like holy shit how did we do this I don't understand how we did this and I think when I got the email I was just outside of the 1896 Olympic Stadium in Greece which oddly enough would later be used as a location <laughs> Make no bones about it. We are incredibly lucky and incredibly appreciative of what we do. I just don't understand how we stumbled stumbled into being able to do it more than once. So anyway, how's your week been? Uh, well, the biggest protest possible, I guess, took place yesterday. So we hung out on the quieter side of town. And then for some reason, my credit card is blocked. So my bank... Uh, had me on hold for a total of three hours, and I still haven't gotten it unblocked because I still can't get through to the proper person to answer the couple of security questions to use my credit card again. So, yeah, that was our day today <laughs> until this episode got uploaded. <laughs> and I don't think it's spoiling anything to say we've been continuing doing some Historians episodes. We are about halfway through the uh, the season that we are doing first. Oh, we're not revealing the season? Oh, no, we're not saying what the season is for another two weeks yet. We'll announce that in the reunion. We've got to keep you people listening. Right. If you donate to the Patreon, you'll find out sooner. <laughs> in fact, I will promise now, if someone donates to the Patreon, I will release what, what the mole season we're doing first is next week. How's that? Mole Australia 6. We may have joked about that in the episode we did last night. Um. So... Yeah, what did you think of the episode as a whole, to begin with? I think it's the least amount of notes I have overall for the season. Yeah, and then the end is just, what? Which bit, Manu going home, or Gilles turning to the camera and winking at us? I think the the whole of the last five minutes. Especially during the execution when Jens's name gets typed in first. And then you see there are four minutes left. And you know they got to be promoting the final three bit. And then Papa Bear Jill DaCosta types in Manu's name, and I'm thinking, oh no, there's less than four minutes. We still got to do a montage. They got to celebrate being in final three. Then we're going to have a crazy announcement. This isn't looking good for my number one mole pick. Red screen. <laughs> I was thinking about this yesterday. Actually, it's it's not the worst result in the world for you, because... Thinking back to all our suspicions that we've done with this sort of stuff, and thinking back to the last time we did the Belgian Mall finale, which is obviously on our mind in the lead up to Palais 12 on, on Sunday. Last time, Gilles cackled in my ear because I was wrong, and you were very much right. We haven't agreed on a mole since Greece at the final three. Yeah, we both thought it was Alina. Yeah, Alina was the last mole we agreed on. So actually from our point of view with the suspicions, to give us the best chance to not have Gilles cackle in our ears again, it's not the worst thing in the world for one of our mole suspects to go. Obviously, it is gutting that it is Manu. She is very much one of my favourite characters of the season. She's very entertaining. I 100% want to um, to make sure that we're friends with her by the end of Sunday. Dozens of selfies. We need to go into, like, you know, like those photo booth things in the malls that... That, that teen girls go into. So the three of us need to go into a bunch of those if we can find that in Brussels. Oh, damn straight. <laughs> All I'm saying is there is a non-zero chance that when we release the Diary of a Belgian Mole Finale 2 episode next Tuesday, there is a non-zero chance that it will be a picture of us with Manu. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Maybe a selfie. But yeah, actually, from a suspicions point of view for the two of us, it's not the worst thing in the world for one of our main suspects to go home, because it has not happened much this season, to give us the best chance. Yeah, we only have a one in three shot of being wrong. It's going to look bad if we both whiff. <laughs> Assuming we both don't pick the same person, that is. Which, after this episode, I wouldn't be surprised if we do both pick the same person. We'll find out. So, previously, the final five got stuck in a time loop and faced repeated paint bombs before running around a banana plantation. At an advantage-laden cliff swing, Manu and Sven came up empty-handed, but one of Anchor and Uma had an awkward fall and became the second person medically evacuated from this season. That is deliberately worded, because as someone did point out in the Bothers Bar Discord, I yet again mixed up Anchor and Uma accidentally last week, and I don't know how it happened. I, 
think they have very similar voices. I think that's what it is. Because obviously they don't look the same. No, I've been able to tell them apart all season long. I can tell them apart in a vacuum. It's just when they're talking and I'm not paying attention and doing my notes. I struggle, I think. So for my own safety in this episode, I'm just going to call them Anchor and Uma or Anchor or Uma. It makes life so much easier. <laughs> I am 99% sure I know which one makes the final three. I'm just not that 100% <laughs> sure that I need to be. Production could have played a mean trick on you and just swap them at the final three. This is going to be super awkward if it gets back to Uma and she ends up chatting to us on Sunday. Yeah. Just putting it out there now. The best way for her to troll you is for her to introduce herself as Anka to you. It's like Fred and George Weasley switching identities. So the final four are heading to their final stop, the small end of Lagomera. Yen says the show must go on and they have to send one more person home. Uma, or possibly Anka, says it's like having a guardian angel pushing her into the finale. Manu has been in a Yen's and Anka or Uma tunnel and is now wondering who the mole is. She has no idea. And something in Sven says he has the mole in his sights. Once they dock, they check into the Parador della Gamera to stay the night. You know what's funny is Sven has a quote saying, I'll arm myself to make it into the finals. That's a terrible pun given how the previous episode ended. Awkward, Sven. Awkward. So this week's episode title is If I Get a Green Screen Later, The Path to the Finale is Literally Open from Germany's Philippe. Beautiful choice given how much we were discussing him last week. And on the subject of Philippe, Looks like the Yokers did not get her over, because we saw no mention of them. Yes. Which I suppose is is probably the fairest option. I don't hate it as much as I could. Yeah, I think after last season they decided it was for the best not to have Yokers in the Final Four quiz. So it's day 18 in San Sebastian de la Gamera. They find two pairs of colourful glasses at the breakfast table, and Sven jokes that he thought that they were Jens's. Gilles appears and tells them that they'll get to know the island very well today. He's looking for two warriors and two doves of peace. Sven describes himself as a sweet and gentle boy, so wants to do peace. Uma and Jens volunteer for warrior, leaving Manu as peace. Uma and Jens leave immediately and head into the mountains. They must follow an ancient path and make a ritual sacrifice before sunset to the gods of the Guanches, the warlike natives of La Gamera. If they succeed, they can earn up to 2,000 euros for the pot. What they'll be sacrificing and how to make it, they'll find out along the way if they learn the languages of the Guanches. And I do have one question. Haven't we done enough sacrificing this season already? Well, I'm glad we're just not sacrificing people this episode. Yeah, especially when they they deliberately focus on the very cute dog. You go, oh, they're not going to be that mean, are they? They're not going to make them sacrifice a dog, of all things. Tenth anniversary season. Gotta kick it up. That is absolutely the way to get a show cancelled, It's to kill a dog. <laughs> Because people have done studies on this before. Viewers of television programs care far more if a dog dies than if a person dies. With very good reason. They meet Kiko, who teaches them the Silvo Gamera. The Grandchurch use it to communicate with each other when goat herding. They don't have enough time to learn how to whistle, but Kiko will teach them to recognise whistled words. Luckily for them, they both speak Spanish, which helps in this case. Manu and Sven get to see a different side of La Gamera, as it was a refuge for young Americans who didn't want to be called up to Vietnam in the 1960s. It was, as a result, a haven of hippie culture. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw a cousin a cousin there. This is very much the, the area of the Canary Islands that I think you would probably most fit in. Well, I, I want to visit there now after seeing it. I'm sure Ellie will take you in and give you some of her special tea or whatever they got. <laughs> yeah. Sven says he knows nothing about La Gamera, apart from the fact that it's the name of a club in Afghan. There wasn't much peace there. I now want to know what the war stories of Lagomera actually were for Sven. That might be something we need to ask him next week. What's funny too is that then we get the the that Jefferson Airplane song playing. Where it's like, well, of course with the hippie culture it fits in perfectly. Although I think it's the, the goat milk that makes you stronger. Kiko's Crash Course teaches Uma and Yen's the word for animals, colours and shapes. All of which they will need. And they're also taught the shepherd's jump, which seems like a great idea after the events of last episode. Okay, so I wasn't the only one who winced and cringed every time Uma or Jens uh, tried to slide down the pole. I was waiting for someone to knack at their ankle every yeah. time we saw them do this. Even the locals too, and they're not even in the season. They're not even contestants, and I was nervous for them. 
especially because of the one guy, um, his brother or cousin or whoever that was, he was a lot more heavier set. That's going to be a bit more impact on that guy's ankles. I'm sure this was tested to absolute oblivion after last week, but I still winced every time. Well, Jens took a... He, he was wiping out pretty good. Jens was definitely told he was not allowed to do the shepherd's jump. He was definitely told that Uma had to do it when they got to that point. Because it's very interesting that they were both taught it, and only one of them had to do it. Yeah, I bet you the original plan is they both had to do it together throughout the challenge, and they said, eh... Let's have a proper round to play out. So Uma Aranka picks it up quickly, but Jens takes a little bit longer, and he does nearly take Uma out with his pole. And that is not nearly the worst sexual innuendo that is going to come from this challenge. Gilles meets up with Manu and Sven, and tells them they get to spend all afternoon in bed, like their John Lennon and Yoko Ono. They will be playing Wheel of Fortune, and each of the ten phrases they get earns some prizes worth up to €300 Euros at the end of the challenge. Yeah, 300 euros per Logan. I mean, I, I mean slogan. The slogan Anders challenge. Hippie challenge. <laughs> I do also have to point out this is not the first time there has been a Wheel of Fortune game on uh, De Mol Bell here. We had it on the uh, on the boat in Mexico. So this is actually technically a callback challenge. It's Belchia's version of a switchback. Except they didn't say it was the most memorable challenge of all time. No. And to be perfectly honest, the boat version of Wheel of Fortune was not the most memorable challenge in that season by a long shot. So the first theme is Flora, and they can buy letters for 50 euros. The bed is also surrounded by alarm clocks. When one goes off, they've got three seconds to stop it, or they have to solve the puzzle within 15 seconds. They solve it and can pick prizes worth up to 250 euros because they bought an E. Anything left on the bed at the end of the challenge is theirs to keep for the pot. I'm pretty sure there was some E in that coffee that Ellie served up. The second theme, ironically, is self-awareness. They buy an E again, and then an I. Sven misses an alarm clock, and they have to solve in 15 seconds. At the last second, they get it, and buy a dream catcher and a dress. And they had a Buddha head at one point, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, just having a Buddha head in your possession is very much frowned upon in Thailand. Yeah, it's probably for the best that you watch this episode outside of Thailand. Yes. So for all the Thai listeners, or... And people with long-term Thai visas, make sure you're in a private area and with a VPN watching this episode. Where do you think the mole would want to be in this challenge? Well, I suspected Manu, so I was thinking, eh, I guess the Wheel of Fortune one, if you just kept, keep kicking things off the bed, you can lose a lot of money that way, which she did. Yeah, I think in the same way as the time loop challenge, there isn't necessarily a right answer to this. But, on the surface of it, you probably want to be on the bed because there's up to 3,000 euros there rather than 2,000. But the problem is that Sven was so unsuspicious this week. Yes, and during the warrior challenge, Uma played it as I expected a mole would, where she understood the whistles way before Jens did to build up their confidence before the challenge started, and then they just kept making mistake after mistake after mistake. And she was the one responsible for retrieving everything, and and she just kept messing up constantly. I'll say this now, because Jens is my number one suspect, unsurprisingly, this week, given I subscribed to the Logan Saunders tactic of suspecting someone till they go home. If Jens is not the mole next week, this episode is the moliest that a contestant has ever acted on Belgian mole. He was so suspicious in both of his challenges this week. Ludicrously so, I would say. Getting called out for it by Uma a lot of the time. Yeah, it's almost as if he was trying too hard to be the mole. But I wonder whether it goes back to the thing we were discussing a couple of weeks ago about whether they really just want to make it an obvious mole so someone finds them at the end of the season, even though they've only got four weeks. Yeah, but they still have the final three round. Especially after Lenny went so undetected last, last season. It was already a risk going into this season, and then when they got to replace them all halfway through, it gets super dangerous on top of that. Yeah, but they also had more information to work with to see the change in everyone's behavior if they were picked as the mole, though. I'm just putting it out there. If he's not the mole, then he really, really sabotaged a lot of these games. Uma and Jens resume their walk. For each mistake they make, their sacrifice is worth 500 euros less. They can whistle to get the answer and have two chances for each whistle. 
Jens decides that they need to take a dog with them. If they're wrong, they have to retrace their steps and lose 500 euros from the potential prize. And then Uma, Uma comes across the sign and says, milk the animal and then take the milk with you. And she just just she just she stops talking and has a really long pause. And then Yen says, um, we definitely took the wrong animal, unless you want to give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, from my rudimentary knowledge of milking animals, I'm not sure dogs are the most cooperative to milk. It's like a quote from Meet the Parents. <laughs> And then we get a scene that I feel like needed to be in soft focus with some sort of dirty, dirty jazz music playing underneath it when Yen starts milking a goat and has quotes such as, I'm just going to get in there massaging her teats. You should play with a pregnant woman's nipples too. He plays subtly with the nipples. (laughs) I believe he said if he plays with it, the, the goat will get excited. And then at the end, he says, doing this is fun. Yeah, it was absolute filth. And then for some reason, here comes the sun place after he finishes up with the goat. I'm not sure it was the sun coming after that challenge. <laughs> I'm surprised Uma didn't just walk away and let Jens have a long time. Why well, do you think he was sleeping outside afterwards? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he started off in the tent with Sven, but then it just got too uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, I think he pitched his tent a few hours before everyone else did, if you know what I mean. I think if the mole was on the warrior side, the tactic is obviously to try and mess up at least once every time, which they obviously did. Yeah. And whenever Jens made an incorrect suggestion, Uma always went along with it. She never corrected Jens once, thinking, eh, I kind of doubt you. But she never really put her foot down and say, I'm overriding what Jens is saying. That could have just been her suspecting Jens and going, mm, he might be the mole though. I'm going to just test him in this challenge because it'll only cost 500 euros. That's nothing in the, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, but she tested him three times. I think it is probably one of those two who is the mole. Yeah, when you said that Jens was acting the moliest to this episode... Sven acted the least molliest out of anybody all season in a single episode. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that Sven is a contestant after this week. The other two I'm not so sure about, which does sadly mean I've lost first suspicions, but... What about second suspicions? And second suspicions, because he was my number one on both anyway. I'm still going to keep an eye on first suspicions next week, by the way, just as a point to see who would have won had we continued first suspicions. I thought Uma and Jens were going to lose this challenge because of how frequently they were drinking the goat's milk all throughout the challenge. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if that's supposed to be a ritual offering, that that's ever so slightly insensitive. Yeah, it's an offering, not an ingesting. Yeah, especially when they then, by the look of things, take it with them to the campsite afterwards. And then I'm thinking, if I'm Uma, do I really want to be drinking goat's milk that's been milked by Jens? Exactly. You don't know whether it is all just goat's milk or another bit of white stuff. (laughs) On the subject of the goat as well, when you look at those three animals, you probably don't even need to whistle. Because you know there's going to be some sort of offering. They're not going to kill the dog. And they're not going to make it easy enough to just give you a rabbit's hutch. So it's probably going to be the goat. Well, that's what what Manu said in her confession, she, she said, in what culture do they sacrifice dogs as a ritual? Like, the amount of complaints they would get if they sacrificed a dog, they're never going to even even remotely entertain that idea. And they're not just going to let you carry a rabbit such with you. So on the beach, the hippies have a good tactic, buying letters initially, and then Sven putting his copywriter skills to good use, because that's what he does as a job. Both of them miss another clock, but Sven solves again. After eight phrases, they've got 1,700 euros of items. However, the bed also seems to have some sort of booking mechanism, so they probably shouldn't cheer too much just yet. It's like they got one of the messed up beds from the Austin Powers movies. So, Uma says the mountain has Jurassic Park vibes, and we get a very subtle piano-led version of the Jurassic Park theme again. Which, as I mentioned last week, I love the Jurassic Park theme. It's nice and subtle, this one. But it plays twice. It plays once when Uma says it, and then once when they get to the uh, when they get to the campsite as well. They then find a second sign saying they must fill the ganigo with milk. The silgo will tell them what colour it is. They guess it's the red one. Uma sent up to grab it and descend with it safely, 
i.e. not yens. They pour the milk and spill it, but then find out they filled the wrong jar. It was the brown one, so it's now only worth a thousand euros. Yep, they're all failing miserably. When they see the sign, Jens then thinks it's the white one, so they run back and see that it's definitely brown. <laughs> yeah. This was when he was blatantly just trying to be suspicious, whether he's the mole or yeah. not. This isn't subtle. The problem is I don't know if the mole wants to be subtle at the end of this season. I don't know whether the mole wants to be subtle. I actually went into this before I knew that Manu went, saying to myself, if Uma is still there, I'm probably going to have to suspect her just so one of us wins our weekly suspicions. But I can't not suspect Jens after this week, I don't think. If it is him and I don't pick him, I'm going to be absolutely good. Yeah, during the pot scene, I specifically wrote my notes thinking, man, both of them are super suspicious during this task. (laughs) Going into this finale, I'm not going to be as gutted if I'm wrong as I was in Vietnam, or as I am in any other season, I don't think. Because I like all three of them. Whichever one of the three of them is the mole. I'm going to be happy. I'm just stupid competitive and don't want you to win. I can't let you win. (laughs) So the hippies have 1,850 euros worth of items after all ten phrases. Jill reminds them that he said anything still on the bed will be going into the pot. So they have five minutes to keep everything on the bed. And one of them must also stay in the bed. The bed then rises to begin their Survivor Fiji final immunity challenge in a bed adventure. And a ball immediately drops and they lose 50 euros. And Dream somehow wins immunity. I can't remember whether we've discussed this on the podcast, but I think that is my favourite final immunity challenge. In terms of like the shorter and the shorter ones that they've done? In terms of the really creative ones they've done, I really like the rising ramp with the dripping water challenge. The waterboarding challenge. It's not waterboarding, there's no towels over the faces. I really like that it is it is an actual challenge for them, and it's a proper build. Yeah, the oh, it's one of my favorites too. The only downside is it's only like a 20 minute challenge, but it's a brutal 20 minutes. Just like how the goat being milked, it was a brutal 20 minutes for that goat this episode. Can you imagine the goat on the bed ramp? If Sven and Manu had to try and keep the goat on, on the bed? A goat might actually not be terrible at it because they do walk up mountains. They're pretty good when it comes to ramps of of some description, hill form at least. It'd be funny if the goat just starts sweating and gets all nervous looking down at the bottom of the bed. (laughs) The rabbit would have been absolutely fucked, but a goat would have been alright. And to be fair, after the the challenge, the goat was pretty fucked as well. And if the dog was on there, as soon as the ball falls off, the dog is totally chasing after the ball. Oh, damn straight. Um, Things begin to drop with two and a half minutes to go, dropping them then to 1,600 euros. And I also like how when Manu decides to swear in German by saying Scheiße, it is still subtitled in Dutch. (laughs) There is not much of Belgium that is German speaking, but I appreciate a little bit of German sneaking into this episode. Given that Manu is Brazilian, we know she's she sounds like she's very fluent in English. She has Spanish knowledge. And if she's Brazilian, she probably knows Portuguese too. She speaks Flemish, and now we got we get some German thrown in there. I think she speaks four languages from her intro at the start of the season. So probably English, Portuguese, Spanish, and Flemish. Yeah, because she does know a little bit of Spanish, doesn't she? So yeah, we pretty much know what they're going to be, I think. Yeah, maybe that's the only word she knows in German. Yeah. Uh, So Manu slips off with just two seconds left, and her dropping, along with the 400 euros that she is attached to, drops them to 1,100 euros of 3,000 for the challenge. Gilles also tells him that the warriors can earn money, and he suggests that Sven and Manu go and set up the tents to pamper them a little bit. The final choice of the warriors is the cave, one represented by a circle, one represented by a triangle, and one represented by a square. Yen suggests they go for the circle as it's the easiest one to go to, and yet again they're wrong. Thankfully they choose correctly, and earn themselves 500 euros of 2,000. When setting up the tent, Sven tells Manu to be careful not to get a pole in her eye, and almost immediately after, she gets a pole in her eye. Yeah, I was thinking, geez, even pitching a tent could have sent somebody home. Yeah, it's genuinely dangerous for them all. I don't know what it is about this group of people, but they are klutzes. It'd be funny if her eye did get poked out, and then you just have Sven elbowing Jill DaCosta and say, oh, I think she's seriously hurt, and then Jill just peers over like, hmm, we lost another contestant. Final three by default, I guess. 
Yeah. So Jens says he's never held animal nipples in his hand. He's doing this deliberately at this point, I think. Yeah. He just knows that we're going to be listening and and drawing attention to his his frankly smutty behaviour. But I'm a sucker for for terrible terrible jokes like this. So keep the animal nipple jokes coming. We're just lucky he didn't play with his own during this tense scene. He says he felt a connection with the goat. Uma is suspicious of Jens's intentions. She almost always knew what the answer was, but she wanted to bait him in this challenge. Given that um, how much of a connection Jens had with the goat's nipples, you could say that they are bosom buddies. They really are. Fun fact, he's invited the goat over to Barcelona to then go and play with his nipples. Marry Sophie doesn't mind. <laughs> Manu tells us that she's never heard of anyone sacrificing a dog, so it's obviously going to be a goat. And Sven says he's mainly been watching Manu as she dropped at the last second off the bed. And we get Uma trying to play the ukulele. We do, and failing, despite the fact that she's a music teacher. They do mention this in the episode. She is a music teacher. Yeah, and Sven keeps teasing her about it relentlessly. She teaches a lot of things, but one of them is music. I think he even says, can you can you stop the wailing now? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> we then see Jill exit a lift and find out that the mole's loved one is back. They are good at provoking, and will meet up with the group in La Rajita. This is an interesting twist. Not only did we have two moles this season, but we have three moles. I think it's interesting, especially given the revelation at the end of the episode, that no one's going to officially know who the mole is until until Sunday evening. The mole's, the mole's visitor will know. Well, yeah, but it, no one outside of the mole and the mole's visitor, because... That's a secret that they've got to keep together. And say it was Sven, it would be him and his brother having to keep that secret together. I don't think that would work very well. It's just another thing that goes against my instincts of, is Sven the mole? I'm not sure him and his brother will have the relationship to hide that secret together. Maybe the newborn baby was the one on the walkie-talkie. Yeah, definitely. His newborn daughter is the one who's managed to control everyone. That's going to be the final revelation. She was. She came out of the womb a saboteur. Like I know for a fact that if I somehow got on a UK version of the mole and was asked who my loved one would be, it would not be my brother. Not just for this reason, but there's no way that me and my brother between us could hide that secret. Well, of course your loved one would be Jill DeCosta. Oh, damn straight. Can you imagine? Will Michael's friend and Jill do the bungee jump? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sven trolls everyone again by saying, this is one of the best spaghetti meals I've ever eaten in La Gomera. We also actually have it established that Manu's a very good cook as well. She's apparently been cooking for them all three weeks. Toon could have really used a lesson from her. He's just gone back to um, to home economics class, that's what it is. <laughs> he had an exam the next day, that's why he had to uh, to throw tied destinies. <laughs> yeah. I can't get an F, it's the, I need those credits. So the final four wake up on day 19 in Benchikikigua. Yen slips outside for some reason. Sven thinks he broke his pelvis in the tent. As he leaves the tent, the poles then come flying up to try and hit him in the eye and get him medivaced. Is this really just Final Destination in disguise? I think it might be. I think this cast of people is genuinely cursed. Because there's three potential injuries in the first half of this episode. And yet they all survive. And then, why did Yen sleep outside? Did he just snore too loud and no one wanted to be in the tent with him? I presume so. I presume he got kicked out by uh, by Sven. Yeah, they let the goat sleep in the tent, but not him. Maybe he just woke up in the night talking about the goat. Sleep talking, yeah. <laughs> sleep milking, it just got slightly inappropriate for, uh, for Sven to be around. So they get treated to a calorie-rich breakfast in the morning, and Manu investigates a pot of something that definitely isn't going to come back in the next challenge. Spoilers, totally is. And Jens also drinks the goat milk that they got the day before. After breakfast, they then head to La Rojita on the coast. They will be playing in abandoned buildings today. It used to be the living quarters of a fish processing company. One by one, they will enter it blindfolded, and the goal is to push five buttons to earn 5,000 euros. Wind chimes will lead them to interesting places. However, there are also archers who, if they see a contestant remove their blindfold, will shoot and take them out of the game. They decide to send Uma, then Jens, then Manu, and then Sven into the building. The buttons are in the second building, but first, Uma has to answer three questions to find out where they are. 
She has 15 minutes total to search both buildings. She finds a pepper and is asked whether peppers were in Almagrote, the typical tapping yard from Lagomera that they ate at breakfast. That was goat's cheese, as we saw Manu say, so their answer is no. The second question is whether a particular perfume belongs to Manu. She says yes, definitely, and Manu confirms that she wears a Marnie code. The third question is asking whether a particular medication belongs to Sven. He says yes, as it will be the ointment for his shoulder. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was Cialis. I'm pretty sure it's the Volterol that we saw Leonard Wright demold on someone's back in last year. I think it's just the off-brand version of Volterol. So with just over 10 minutes left, she leaves the first building. And Shiel is waiting for her there and asks her the three questions. She gets two of the locations from him, as the pepper was in the seven yard. In the second building, there are more shooters, but the other three can help her find them by throwing axes at a target. If they hit one of the rings, that shooter will make a noise, helping her know which rooms are safe to take her blindfold off in. She hears the masked voice of the loved one of the mole. They guide her to the first button, but also to a message from her boyfriend, Davy. They tell her there is no shooter in the room, but Sven's shot then proves that is a lie. And she leaves that room with seven minutes left. Yen hits the alarm of one of the shooters, which is conveniently where she is. She hits the button in that room and has four minutes to reach the roof. She's told by the accomplice that there are two mole books in that room, Bert and Gretel's. She can read them, but of course, there is a shooter she doesn't know about behind her. She takes the blindfold off briefly to look at Bert's book, and then gets shot by the shooter in the back. Yeah, no money there. Jens is asked whether an ingredient was also in Almagrate, if Sven's deodorant is in the room, and whether a book belongs to Manu. He gets two of the three locations as a result, and has just over 11 minutes left, and the shooter locations have slightly changed. He gets a message from Mary Sophie too, and headbutts the TV whilst looking for a button. And Mary Sophie is pouring out to Ricard, who was a contestant from Survivor 41. The one thing that makes me doubt, maybe, that Jens is the mole, is that the masked voice of the mole's accomplice sounded male, and Jens is the only person left with a female loved one. Maybe Mary Sophie wanted to sound really masculine on purpose. Yeah, I wonder whether that was a deliberate trick and then making it much more difficult to find to work out whether it is Jens as a result of that. But the voice did sound masculine to me. Obviously it's meant to, obviously it's meant to be disguised and stuff, but when they were speaking to, to Jens and Uma and Manu and Sven eventually, it did sound like it was a guy masking the voice. Yeah, it would have really thrown... It would have been easier to figure out who the mole is if... Uh... Especially if Sven's family came up on the screen and then the, the mole's accomplice says, Oh, your family is way cutest. Your family look very familiar. Don't know why the accomplice is suddenly Darth Vader. <laughs> I find your lack of family disturbing. <laughs> or or the, other th- the other thing that really confirms it might be masculine is when the TV screen comes on and then, you know, that person on the other end is like, oh, oh, that's one ugly baby. The thing that makes me think it might be Jens is going back to something I said last episode about seeing the Mole and Jill interact for the first time face-to-face, actually publicly. Jens doesn't really react when when the Mole's accomplice comes on the earpiece. Everyone else really reacts and everyone else, like, tears up at the family message and stuff. Jens doesn't. It's really interesting. Yeah, he's very focused. Like, if Jens is the only person who knows exactly what's coming, then he wouldn't react to a message from Mary Sophie. He was tearing up when the goat appeared, but he didn't He didn't tear up when Mary Sophie appeared. Would have been a big giveaway if he was the mole, if the mole's accomplice was the goat. <laughs> Instead of a mass voice, you just hear a goat bleating through the earpiece. Yeah. Damn it, he got me again. I picked up Gretel's journal. Damn it, code. Uh, he gets disorientated and then is guided by the henchman to the button. Manu hits the third shooter's alarm and Sven hits number one. The henchman then offers elimination questions for that evening and Bert's mole book. Sven hits the third alarm, which tells Jens where all three of the shooters are. He takes his blindfold off in his safe room and finds a second button. Thanks to all the alarms going off, he knows where he's safe and he runs to the roof to save two buttons, but not without missing the last one. Very suspicious. Yeah, that's a lot of a lot of tunnel busy. I'm fully aware that I am 
super in a Jens tunnel. I said this last week. I'm I'm fully aware that I'm very much gung ho on Jens after the past couple of weeks. But that's exactly what a mole would do in that situation. I think is when nobody else can see what they're doing, run past a button. But the audience sees it. Yeah, but the audience can see it. There's always got to be that that hint for the audience. They don't want to properly hide it from the audience, necessarily. It's not the traitors where they outright tell you at the start of the season. But they also want to make it possible for the mole to be found. And sometimes we get far more knowledge than they have. Moles running past things, hidden clues, that sort of stuff. We should always have a little bit more knowledge than the contestants. And I I don't think anyone other than Jens played that second challenge as a mole. Uma didn't play that as a mole. Or like a mole should. Because the mole really wants to be at the back of the pack. Because the later in the game you are, the more control you have over how many buttons actually get pressed. Yeah, Sven was quite the point guard here with determining the order. Yeah, Sven is in the hero position, which is exactly where the mole wants to be in this challenge. But Sven is not the mole after this episode. And I'll say Belgium really agree with me on that as well. I've seen the uh, the poll on one of the fan sites at the moment, and it is very much a two-horse race between Uber and Jens. But Sven kind of bullied his way into being last, and because of the agreement that they had, Jens by default had to go second. Uma was not in the best position for a mole, because all you can really do is accidentally lose two of the buttons, but someone can overwrite that, which Jens didn't do. I think, unless Uma was really unlucky here, this challenge is really not played like a mole would play it by her. I think they all said that they expected the mole to be near the back of the lineup. Yeah, Manu actually probably had the best position because you go into it knowing how many buttons are pushed and if you screw up enough, like she did, you put all the pressure on the last person and make them a hero or a zero. Manu actually had the best position here, but I would argue that second is probably the second best position for a mole here. You don't want to be first, definitely. And unless you want loads of attention, you don't want to be last. It's funny, um, Manu completely read through the the mole's accomplice with the false directions. Manu's interactions with the mole's accomplice were my favourite thing in the entire episode. The subtle thing that made me laugh harder than anything else was her when she was faced, or not faced, with the, the screen of her loved ones and her family saying how much they love her and her being really upset she can't take a blindfold off, and she says, stupid, shitty mole, and the accomplice takes offence at that. That is way funnier than anything else. Yeah, the accomplice says, excuse me? Excuse me? I had to pause the episode after that because I was laughing so hard at it. Stupid, shitty mole. Um, that's my friend you're talking about? <laughs> excuse me, that is my brother. You do not talk about the Petty family like that. Who gives you the right to say that? It's less stupid shitty mole and more stupid sassy mole. Get it right. You can't you can't see it through this walkie-talkie, but I have the piece sign up with the index finger down right now. So Manu is offered the same as Jens, today's questions, and Bert's mole book. She says she doesn't want Bert's book. It's not going to be any use to her. She enters the question room and finds two envelopes, one containing tonight's questions and one containing the ones from the previous one, which presumably is the one that Anka got cancelled. The accomplice teases her, not saying which one it is. Yen says Manu is the one to gamble as she wants to stay in the game above all costs. She's only got five minutes left and hasn't pressed any buttons. She takes the correct envelope without removing her blindfold and accidentally skips the button in the closet. She then heads to the roof where she knows a button is, but accidentally skips past it. She leaves the game with no button, but with the questions in her pocket. There is a really funny one where the mole's accomplice, uh, or Manu asks, where's the roof? And the mole's accomplice says, uh, the roof is located on top of the building. I mean, no matter who the loved one is, they were having so much fun doing this. They were having an absolute blast dicking with these people. So she admits to the other two that she went for the questions and got no buttons, despite getting all three questions correct. Sven is last in. He will need to find the final three buttons. He gets two of the three questions right, so we'll have to find the last button himself. The one he doesn't get is the one at the exit, which both Jens and Manu missed. Jens thinks that it will be tough for Sven to resist a message from his family, especially as he hasn't seen his girlfriend for a while. He's not tempted by the message from his brother, but as soon as his girlfriend and his daughter enter, he does stop and have a little blindfolded cry. 
He's also offered the elimination questions for tonight and Bert's mole book, but he says he's not tempted. He finds the first button, thanks to the accomplice. He was allowed to throw axes for himself for 10 minutes, and the shooter alarms go off in response to that. He finds his second button and goes looking for the final one. He stumbles into the questions room and takes an envelope. He then swaps it for the correct one. He then also stumbles to the mole books and guesses Bert's correctly. He heads to the roof with a minute to go. He scoured every room looking for buttons and found absolutely nothing, but he found two of the three buttons, meaning they earn absolutely nothing out of 5,000 euros for the challenge, 1,600 of 10,000 for the episode, and 26,390 of 74,750 for the season so far. I've seen worse ratios. Yeah, they're actually not doing too badly, but obviously that also includes the Philippe half of the season, which they exited with about 17,000, I think, by the end of uh, by the end of Philippe's time on the show. Yeah, it's, it's it's a bit tougher if you're a contestant and the mole is getting more than 20 minutes of sleep per day. Yeah, so they ended Philippe's section of the season with 16,350 of 41,600. And they're now on 26,390 of 74,750. So actually they've earned about a third since the mole got changed. The mole is performing much better. Yeah. Jens admits he didn't have his blindfold on at the end, but missed the button in his enthusiasm to complete the challenge. And we then get a pre-test diary of the mole, which is actually a briefing, and I'm going to pull them up on this. They are reunited with their loved one. You're being serious? You were there all along? Yes. We did well today, huh? We did super well. It was cool seeing you at work. I'm super proud. Keep doing what you're doing. I find your lack of mole disturbing. <laughs> It is now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home, except for the mole who can never go home. And whoever survives this test will be the final three of the season. Full disclosure, any time we get a briefing of the mole now, I am going to do the Darth Vader voice because it makes you laugh so much. Sven says the 5,000 euros went wrong. He's mainly looking at the girls as a result of this. Uma was deceived by the loved one, so she felt like a loser. Yen says Uma exposed herself with the tears. She could have been the perfect mole, but it's just not her. Um says Jens passed the last button that wasn't pressed. That is fishy. Jens says Sven had the perfect mole action. Questions? Mole book, but no money. Uma says the mole would probably want to go last. The hero position. Sven says Manu found nothing. You'd find one button at least, surely. Manu says everyone knows she unintentionally sabotages things sometimes. And Sven says he's following his guts and going all in on Manu being the mole. Gilles says that the big money machine seems to have stalled a bit in the last couple of days, but they will still enter the finale with €26,390, and sadly only three candidates. Jens gets the green screen before Manu is sent home. What? And I do have the note, which is just, well, shit. I think my note is, the mole is Uma? I must admit, I do quite like that we have a season finally where your mole goes home at final four and you're left scrambling for who the mole could be, because it always happens to me. I don't think we've had another season where your mole's gone home at final four and you've had to actually think of who it is on the fly. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Yeah, I think this is the first. It's the first in a long time. Yeah, I put a note in the uh, in the Bothers Bar Discord that said, Saunders is going to be pissed. I don't know. I'm, I'm as excited as he ends his around a goat's nipple right now. No, not that excited. So Manu says she gambled and lost. She knew that it was a stupid move, but she did it anyway. Sven describes her as an explosion of smiles, the Brazilian sun in the group. And seeing her just made you happy. And I'll be honest, seeing her on the screen made me happy as well. She's definitely a Harmstone favourite. Gilles describes her as a star as the interrogator in the uh, paintball game. Jens says he was impressed that she made the right judgment every single time, and she told Uma to own it if she took the first exemption. And she says she wishes she could hug them all one last time, but that's not how this show works. And Uma instead has to settle for a hug from Sven, and a half-hearted one from Jens, who just doesn't care at this point he's in the finale. (laughs) I was half tempted to try and make that group hug our banner for the week. But I went back and watched it and just laughed at Jens's reaction of him just kind of not even going into the hug. He just kind of stands there, and just lets them hug each other. You don't have this final three is not the most expressive trio of people to have. No, as I said last week, I would have rather had Uma go home and Manu be in the final three just because they're probably the three most entertaining people of the season. I'm half happy it's these three. 
I would have rather even went home just because she's obviously been a, a second suspect for a lot of the season for a lot of people. But I never hate a Belgian Mole Final 3, to be perfectly honest. So, as Manu drives away, Gilles tells us the finalists are now known, and the Mole's identity is not, and will not be revealed on location this time, but instead in front of 10,000 people at Palais 12 on Sunday. We will also be able to influence the final assignment, and he then winks at us, which is our banner for the week. Yeah, he says, but we know better. Maybe see you Sunday? Wink. So next time, the final three walk their way to the finale, Uma climbs, Sven licks some letters, and the final test is sat. However, a small error leads to them wowing 10,000 people as part of one final live act before the mole is revealed. Very, very curious to see how it plays out in the press room and at Panel 12. So am I. It actually gave me more questions than answers, knowing that my suspicion of a live reveal was correct, because I have a feeling we are going to be interviewing the final three without knowing who the mole is. The only way I could see it happening is if we do the interviews after the finale has filmed. I guess we can't waterboard them to get a to extract a confessional from them, eh? No, because if if we don't get to see the finale before everyone else in Palais 12 as well, I don't know what we're going to do about notes. That could be a very haphazard episode next Thursday. It could be very interesting for us both. It may just be me having to remember things from the episode while you kind of drunkenly stumble around. A lot of slurred speech. Substitute me for Van Bool. So with Manu going home, Logan's team is now just Uma and mine is Sven and Jens. Uma's leading the way with 2.30, then Jens and then Sven. When we adjust to Manu's exit, it becomes 1.8, 1.9 and 2.30 respectively. Only Logan had Manu at number one. Bindles, Euroan, Walter, Jack, Martin, Bram, Bjorn and Jason all had her in either five or six. I think they all had her in fifth. Three people, David, April Bride 15 and Jason, all have a perfect score going into the finale. Who do you suspect, Mr. Saunders? Uh, well, my number one's gone, and based on how this episode went, I got Uma. I got Uma as my number one now. Uma is finally getting a suspicion seven weeks into this season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I got Uma number one, Jens number two, and Sven number three. And just like last week, my top two are reversed from yours. Mine is... Sven in number three, Uma in number two, and Jens Vitterbrook is the mole. Mm. So as I said, Diary of a Mole Finale 2 is coming Tuesday, May 10th at 9pm BST, assuming we get enough material before our regular recap on its normal day, Thursday the 12th of May. As with our Vietnam Finale episode, this one's going to be recorded very late on Sunday night, slash Monday morning if last time's anything to go by, so we absolutely cannot vouch for its quality, we are probably going to be very drunk and very tired, respectively. <laughs> but I am incredibly excited for it. I am actually more nervous than I was last time, mainly because we've got something to live up to from last time. But I'm interested to see how how this final chapter of the season is going to play out. Because they can't even record the reunion early. They can't tell the other eight people who the mole is, because the winner will know that they've won. So... The reunion surely is going to get recorded probably the Monday rather than the Saturday, but they can't record people's reaction to the mole revealing themselves. So I don't know what they're going to do. Oh, I didn't even think about the reunion special. What they might actually do is have the other eight people in a viewing room of some description for the mole's reveal and then record their reaction. That's the only thing I can think of. Or they have a very, very quick turnaround for the reunion episode. Yeah, because I can't see them recording the reunion episode on Sunday as well, because that's just too much faff for them. It's going to be interesting, once we know all of those decisions, it's going to be interesting to ask Jill what their other ideas were. Well, I guess he's not going to share the other ideas since it'll be saved for next season, but what made him make the decisions that he made, especially with all of the other curveballs thrown throughout the season? Yeah. Have you got anything else you want to say? No. In that case, thank you for listening to our Demolviakia Season 10 recap. We'll be back next week to conclude the hunt for the newest mole in the Canary Islands, live from Palais 12 in Brussels. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at blogsuperquacky, and I'm MJ Harmstone. Thank you as always to Natalia for the subtitles. We'll see you next week for our finale week extravaganza. Peace out and just chill until the next of flavoring.
Hello, me again. Just popping back to say that if you've got any questions you want us to ask the final three, or maybe Gilles if we can nab him, send them in on social media or on the email. We'll try and ask any that we get in. See you on Tuesday. Trust. I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs>